Hello and welcome to another installment of Grasping Scripture. Glad you could join us today as we delve into the 17th chapter of the book of Genesis. I'm glad you can be part of this study of God's Word with me and want to invite you, if you're new to the study, back up and start at chapter 1. It lays a groundwork and a, and a foundation through the account of Genesis that will help you understand where we're at and some of the concepts at play here in chapter 17. But, you know, if you don't want to do that and you want to dive in here, we welcome you just the same. Uh, glad to have you along for the study of God's Word and glad you could be part of this podcast. Encourage you, uh, tell your friends about it. You know, I hope this is a useful tool that helps, as the name suggests, helps people to grasp hold of Scripture, to understand God's Word and, and kind of see how it fits together and how it applies to life. So I, I welcome you as part of this a journey through God's Word. Now let's turn to the Lord in prayer before we dig into the passage. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again we thank you for the many blessings that you have given us, for the opportunity to, to gather in this format and to study your Word, to, to read our way through Scripture, discussing it and, and pondering different parts of it. And Father, we ask that you would give us ears to hear your voice through your Word. Give us a heart that is sensitive to the promptings of your spirit, that we might not just read this as a, as a religious text or a historical text, but Father, that we would read this as your living word and that it would speak to us, challenging us to a greater level of obedience to you. Lord, give us wisdom and discernment as we consider how to apply your word to our hearts and our lives. Again, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, chapter 17 of Genesis. As we dig into this chapter, some of the things you're going to see, uh, God coming to Abraham and establishing a covenant. And you may go, wait a minute. He just established covenant back in 15, which would have been 13 plus years prior to this, maybe. Um or at least Ishmael's 13. So it's longer than that. But at a point prior to this, back in chapter 15, God made that covenant. Remember that vision and God ordered him to split the animals and, and lay the halves out. And then these representations of the presence of God passed between the halves. And God made these promises about Abraham or Abram at that point, uh, being father of a nation and many descendants and so on and so forth. You may go, well, we're just rehashing that here in 17 in a different format. You know, what's, what's going on? Is this just a collection of old stories and they're just something got out of order and they're retelling it with a little different spin. What's the deal? No, this is different. Uh, this is God reminding Abram of that covenant back in 15, but back in 15, it was a one-sided covenant. It was God declaring his promises to Abram and his descendants. Here in 17, it is a mutual agreement covenant. There are um, requirements placed on Abram and his descendants as their part of the covenant. So it's, it's a little different. It is a, a reiteration, but it's not quite the same thing as a rehash of chapter 15's covenant. So let's take a look at what we got here. And there's also some clarification that God gives in this passage about the covenant as well, because things are about to get messy. You know, it's fine when you've got one heir and descendant, but when you have multiple descendants, the question comes up, okay, which one does the covenant apply to? God clarifies that here. Now, chapter 17, verse one, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai. That is El meaning God and Shaddai meaning almighty. Uh, this is a, a title for God that um, speaks of strength. Now, last chapter, Hagar described God as the God who sees me or the God who listens. But here, here he's described with strength. And we commonly will translate this as God Almighty. So I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. 
I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. At this, Abram fell down on the ground. Then God said to him, this is my covenant with you. I will make you the father of, of a multitude of nations. What's more, I am changing your name. You will no longer be Abram, which by the way means exalted father. Instead, you will be called Abraham, which sounds like, uh, it's not literally, but uh, it's a word play on a Hebrew phrase for um, father of many. So he went from being exalted father to a new framework here, father of many, uh, father of many nations, as, as the promise goes, multitude of nations. So again, that sentence, it will no longer be Abram. Instead, you will be called Abraham, for you will be father of many nations. I will make you, verse 6, I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations and kings will be among them. Oh, so there we get a little foreshadowing that uh, Israel or Judah, or the combined kingdom of, of Israel, would ultimately become a monarchy. Verse 7, I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you from generation to generation. So this isn't just, I'm making this covenant, but it's God saying, I'm going to confirm this covenant from generation to generation, a perpetual thing. It's ongoing. It's always there in front of them. This is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Now that's pretty significant when God says that, when God Almighty El Shaddai declares, I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And I will give the entire land of Canaan, where you now live as a foreigner, to you and your descendants. It will be their possession forever, and I will be their God. Um, that's a big promise. That is a promise of a place. That is a promise of an identity. And that is a promise from God that it is in his hands. It's a pretty big deal. And I realize verse 8, especially in, in the context of, of here and now, um, it's 2024, it's post-October 7th. We've had the, the whole conflict going on in Israel and Palestine. And there's, there's questions of legitimacy of, of land right and everything else. But uh, the truth is found in God's word, and, and here it is. This is an everlasting covenant. I will always be your God, the God of your descendants after you, and I will give the entire land of Canaan, where you now live as a foreigner, to you and your descendants. It will be their possession forever, and I will be their God. Um. Yeah. So there, there is a historical claim and, you know, God says he's, he's going to provide that. Now, has he removed the people of Israel from the land from time to time as, as punishment, as, as a way of drawing them back to faithfulness to him? Yes. Historically that has happened sometimes for long stretches, but, um, still, this is what God has said. So we have to acknowledge that. Now, what is going on here? Again, it is a little bit of a reiteration of the covenant. God reminding Abram, now Abraham, of his promise. But he's saying, look, here's the covenant. Here, here is what I will do as my part of the covenant. And I'm changing your name. Your identity is different. You are no longer exalted father. You are the father of many nations. And you're going to be extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations and kings among them. Not only that, I'm confirming with you my covenant. You are arguing my, you and your descendants after you, generation to generation. So a perpetual thing. This is an everlasting covenant. There's no time expiration date on this thing. And then the promises. I, I will always be your God and God of your descendants. 
I will give you the land of Canaan and to your descendants. and It'll be their possession forever. I will be their God. So there's God's terms in the covenant. Now, we haven't gotten to Abraham's terms of the covenant yet. We'll get there. Or the terms that bind him. But there's a lot there in those eight verses, isn't there? A lot to chew on, especially in light of our modern context, which we shouldn't interpret this passage in our modern context because it was written into a context in its day and age. And we need to understand what it meant and what it said then, because that's what it means now. And that's the, the job of studying scripture. Now we get into what will be the mark of the covenant. What, what, what's Abraham's side of this? It says, then God said to Abraham, your responsibility, ah, because a covenant of this type where both parties agree to things, um, is a more normal covenant than what we saw back in 15. 15 was a one-sided covenant. Here it's two-sided. It says, then God said to Abraham, verse 9, your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant. So your obedience is required here. You and all your descendants have this continual responsibility. What continual responsibility? To obey the terms of the covenant. So God says, I will do all these things. Your side of it, your end of the deal that you've got to hold up is obedience. You've got to remain obedient. Verse 10, this is the covenant that you and your descendants must keep. Each male among you must be circumcised. Now, this was not something that they did, but it's something they're going to start doing. Um, if you don't know what circumcision is, look it up. Um, each male among you must be circumcised. You must cut off the flesh of your foreskin as a sign of the covenant between me and you. Uh, this is this is rather personal and you know painful. And it sets you apart, different than all the other cultures around you. Uh, something very notable. So that's the term. Again, starting in verse 10, this is the covenant that you and your descendants must keep. Each male among you must be circumcised. You must cut off the flesh of your foreskin as a sign of the covenant between you and me. From generation to generation, every male child must be circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. This applies not only to members of your family, but also to the servants born in your household and the foreign-born servants whom you have purchased. So everybody that is part of the community, this applies to all of the male children, male members of the household. All must, verse 13, all must be circumcised. Your bodies will bear the mark of my everlasting covenant. So, there's an obligation upon Abraham and his household as part of this covenant, as well as his descendants and their households. Verse 14, any male who fails to be, so there's a penalty for violation here. Any male who fails to be circumcised will be cut off from the covenant family for breaking the covenant. So anyone who refuses to take part in this symbol of the covenant, removes themselves from being part of the covenant. Now, that cut off from the covenant family, that cut off there can be, um, the terms used there can be interpreted in a few different ways. One, cut off from the promise of God, which is obviously what's going on there. How that plays out, it also is cut off from the covenant community. You know, cut off from the covenant family. That means if if Abraham and his household are all part of this, and somebody refuses in the household to take part in this act of compliance, they've removed themselves from the household. They're on their own. They're no longer part of that community. They're they're cut off from that community. So you know, no more relation there. No more communication there. They're, they're ostracized. They're out. 
Um, so that, you know, that's important. Um, another way this could be interpreted, we don't really see it playing out that way all that much. Um, any male who fails to be circumcised will be cut off from the covenant family. That could mean execution. Don't really see it happening that way. Um, but definitely life became much harder if you were cut off from the covenant community. So this is a big deal. And it's Abraham and his descendants and their households side of the covenant obedience. And the first step in that obedience is, well, it's obedience to God, but obedience to the terms of the covenant, they must comply with this mandate for circumcision. It will mark them physically as being part of God's everlasting covenant. Now in verse 15, it says, then God said to Abraham regarding Sarai, your wife, her name will no longer be Sarai for, or from now on, her name will be Sarah. You may go, well, there's not a whole lot of difference there. And actually there's not. Um, biblical scholars tell us that basically Sarai means princess and Sarah means, would you like to guess? Okay. Time's up. Princess. Yeah. Um, so as far as the meaning of her name, it didn't change. It's more the pronunciation. Sarai would have been more a, uh, a dialect spelling and pronunciation from Ur, whereas Sarah is more of a uh, Hebraic Canaanite dialect. So it, it just there's a variation of the name there, but it's a brings her into the context of where they are instead of where they have been, but also reiterates the idea that she is princess, the one who will give birth to descendants who are kings. Um, kind of significant there. So there's the name change. So there's where we get Abram is now Abraham. Sarai is now Sarah. Verse 16. And I will bless her and give you a son from her. Yes, I will bless her richly, and she will become the mother of many nations. Kings of nations will be among her descendants. Now, he's already heard that in reference to him, but now in reference to Sarah. Then, oh, and here, Abraham, that great man of faith, here's what he does. Verse 17, then Abraham bowed down to the ground, but he laughed to himself in disbelief. How could I become a father at the age of a hundred? He thought, and how can Sarah have a baby when she's 90 years old? So Abraham said to God, may Ishmael live under your special blessing. Now, those two passages, 17 and 18, we're given an insight into what's going on in Abraham's head. He bows and he laughs to himself in disbelief. Kind of like, yeah, right, we're going to have a kid, sure. How could I become a father at 100? She's 90, that's going to happen. But then his response to God, may Ishmael live under your special blessing. He's running on the assumption, okay, yeah, right. We're not going to have any more kids. I'm not going to father a kid. She's not going to give birth to a kid. But we've got Ishmael through Hagar, so he must. God must be talking about that being the lineage you know, our plan to fix the lack of a child problem, refer back to the previous chapter. So Abraham's response to God, may Ishmael live under your special blessing. Then we get to verse 19, God replied, but God replied, no, Sarah, your wife will give birth to a son for you. You will name him Isaac, which is actually a play on the Hebrew word for he laughed. Um, because what was Abraham's, res Abraham's response to God's promise? He laughed to himself. So uh, that constant reminder of Abraham's response there was that God dictated his son would be named. He laughed. Again, verse 19, but God replied, no, Sarah, your wife will give birth to a son for you. You will name him Isaac. And I will confirm my covenant with him and his descendants as an everlasting covenant. 
As for Ishmael, I will bless him also, but uh, just as you have asked. I will make him extremely fruitful and multiply his descendants. He will become the father of 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will be confirmed with Isaac, who will be born to you and Sarah about this time next year. When God had finished speaking, he left Abraham. Now, Abraham was still thinking our plan. You know, we went with plan B and we tried to work it out and God's going to honor that and go with that. And God steps in and goes, no, basically, listen, what did I just tell you? I told you, you and Sarah are going to have a baby, not you and Hagar. So he says, no, Sarah, your wife will give birth to a son. You're going to name Isaac, by the way for that little laughter bit. And I will confirm my covenant with him, his descendants as an everlasting covenant. Isaac is chosen as the child of the covenant and the covenant promises, not Ishmael. Ishmael will be blessed. The promises God has made to Abraham about his descendants in general being vast forming nations, etc., that all applies here to Ishmael. But Ishmael is not the child of the covenant. Isaac is. And so we see a difference there. Yeah, nations will come from both of them. There'll be princes, there'll be kings. But the covenant travels through Isaac. But my covenant will be confirmed with Isaac, verse 21, who will be born to you and Sarah about this time next year. When God had finished speaking, he left Abraham. On that very day, verse 23, on that very day, right after, you know, when when God had finished speaking, he left Abraham. On that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and every male in his household, including those born there and those he had bought. Then he circumcised them, cutting off their foreskins just as God had told him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised, and Ishmael, his son, was 13. Both Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised on that same day, along with all the other men and boys in the household, whether they were born there or bought as slaves, all were circumcised with him. And that's where the chapter ends. But you see what happened? Immediately, he followed the terms of the covenant. Immediately, he responded in faithfulness to what God had said. There is an obedience, but there's also a trust in there. And so he follows the Lord obediently in what was a rather unpleasant experience for them but one that would mark them as being set apart for God. Sometimes being set apart for God can seem unpleasant. It can make you different because we are different. When we know Christ is our Savior and Lord and we seek to live for Him, we don't fit with the pattern of this world anymore. We're different. Paul talks about a circumcision of the heart, meaning that we have set aside who we used to be. And through the work of the Spirit of Christ in our lives, we have been made new creations. Our old sinful self is gone. We have a new life in Christ. And so we live differently. We live in that new life. We live seeking to follow God Almighty, El Shaddai, and to do it in obedience. It's no longer about a ritual. It's no longer about, you know, taking these steps to to circumcise, but it is about living in obedience to God. May we be like Abraham 
that when God makes it clear to us what he wants us to do, on that very day we get up and do it. Trusting in him and seeking to live in obedience to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word made flesh in Jesus the Christ. Thank you for the salvation that he brings, the forgiveness for our sins, that we can be made right with you and know you, that we can have that circumcision of the heart, that we belong to you, and we can trust in your faithfulness and your righteousness. And we can live our lives seeking to follow you, to live in obedience to you and your word. Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.